<clears throat> Welcome to the week of evolution webinar series. We, as Boston University Science Club, Tree of Evolution Committee, collaborated with many scientists who are the experts in their fields to present an evolution themed series for, to you. We want to use the opportunities of the online platform to meet with professors all around the world. Um, our, our mission was always to spread accurate scientific inform information and create platforms where science can be freely discussed and told. When the conditions present in our country are taken into account, it is even more crucial to do so. Therefore, we would like to restate the necessity for free academy as we still protest and stand against the appointed rectors and their undue sanctions. Both university members have been standing against this anti-democratic situation for more than a year. Aside from that, this year we will have nine seminars between 31st of, 1st of January and 7th of February. You can also follow our social media accounts to be posted about the calendar. And today we will welcome Dr. Hildegard Yuker from Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Biology. After she is done with our talk, we will have a short Q&A session. You can ask the questions through chat and our team will edit and direct them to, to Professor Yuker. Welcome again, Professor. Uh, welcome again, Dr. Yuker. Hello. Hello. Now we can see your slides. Okay, so I can start? Yeah, of course. Okay, yeah. yeah. Thanks first um, for this nice introduction and also for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to give this talk. So I will today talk about the evolutionary dynamics of antibiotic resistance on plasmids. Okay, somehow now my slides don't go forward. <laughs> okay, this works. Okay, so, well, I mean, you're all very well aware of the current COVID pandemic, but actually there is also a second um, pandemic going on. I mean, pe people call it the silent pandemic, which is um, the spread of antibiotic resistance, which is like becoming a really um, more and more increasing problem. So a study concluded that in 2019, 1.27 million deaths were attributable to antibiotic resistant bacteria. So I mean, to understand what that number means, this is um, how they calculate it is, um, what, how to interpret it is, means if the same number, if those infections would have been caused by susceptible bacteria, 1.27 million deaths would have been avoided because it would have been um, treatable. If these um, infections wouldn't have occurred at all, I mean, of course, um, way more lives would have been saved. So the WHO says that antibiotic resistance is one of the biggest threats to global health, food security, and development today. So evolution of antibiotic resistance, I mean, it's an evolutionary um, problem. So what you can see here in this graph is a range of antibiotics and the date when they were introduced to the market that's shown here, and then the years um, to resistance discovery. Um, and you can see that, I mean, in some cases here for vancomycin, it has taken 16 years, but in many other cases, really, it was very quick, just two years or one year. So we see that antibiotic resistance evolves really rapidly. Here, for example, for penicillin, actually, I mean, resistance was already detected before it was even introduced to the market. And then this is an evolutionary problem. It means if we want to solve it, um, we need to manage evolution. Okay, so um, what does it mean? One means, it means like we need to optimize treatment strategies in a way that um, yeah, we are slowing down or preventing the evolution of resistance. So by the treatment choices that we are making, for example, the antibiotic dose or also when when we start treatment, like or um, how long the treatment duration is, how many antibiotics we are using in combination, with all of this, we are influences the evolutionary path of the bacteria. And that also means if we know how to do it, we can influence it in a way that resistance either does not evolve or at least um, that the evolution is delayed. And in this, 
we can look either at a single host. And this means like, um, what, what do we do in the treatment of a single host? What we want to achieve there is efficient clearance of the bacterial infection such that the patient recovers quickly. And we want that the within host probability of um, resistance evolution is low. One such uh, strategy that could be applied here that is currently uh, like, I mean, it's receiving uh, more and more attention is sequential therapy. That's a therapy where two antibiotics are rapidly cycled through the treatment of an individual patient. And this has been found to be really good in the lab. But if you look at what's happening, what this looks like in the lab, you see here the antibiotic concentration is a function of time. So when you are quickly, quickly cycling your antibiotics, you first have antibiotic A, and then it switches to B, to A, to B, always at a high concentration. And um, yeah, this is a prompt switch. But things look different in a patient. In a patient, I mean, like um, the drug is taken up and there's metabolization um, and, and so on. And so drug concentrations after you take the drug, I mean, they go up, but then they also decrease again. And that's a gradual process. And if you take the second drug, then you would have like an overlap period where you are actually um, having both drugs in combination. And that's a different um, situation from um, what you are seeing in the lab. So one question we were interested in, it, does it actually make a difference? And um, yeah, in my group, we are studying these problems like by means of mathematical models. I will say a little bit more about this on the next slide. Um, but so my student, Christine, she set up two models, one for the lab and for the patient. And yeah, in the lab, she found that rapid cycling is optimal. And that's also what a laboratory experience by other people have found. So the faster you cycle, the better to avoid resistance evolution and achieve a fast clearance of the infection. But it's a little bit different in the patient due to what I just um, explained to you. Here now it means that a drug characteristic and drug-drug interactions can actually alter the optimal cycling frequency. So sometimes it actually means that, um, that if you cycle a little bit more slowly, it could actually even be better. So that's just one example for such a therapy that we could use and also just like an example um, of something that we are looking at in my group at the moment. But okay, this is something that's happening at the level of an individual patient. But um, if you're looking at infectious diseases, we also actually need to have the entire population in mind. So not just one patient, but an entire host population. And there we want to have a low prevalence of the disease and we would like to have little spread of resistance. And actually sometimes um, what is best, a uh, best strategy for treating one host um, is not necessarily the best at the population level. So we can look at nested uh, models that take both of these levels into account to reveal trade-offs. Okay, so this is like um, for this managing evolution that I just said, we need to optimize our treatment strategies, but um, the basis for this is also that we just fundamentally need to understand bacterial adaptation. So how do bacteria evolve and adapt? And this needs to take account eventually the genetics, the physiology, and also the ecology of bacteria. And that's also then um, the part I want to talk about a bit more today. But first, um, why actually theoretical models? So as I said in my group, we are not doing laboratory experiments. We don't look at patient data, but we develop mathematical models. And um, why that, why are they useful? So one advantage of mathematical models is they're really clear. So you, that you have like clear assumptions, you can also then study in the detail, dissect the problem and understand it very well. Second, it's fully controlled. So you really understand what's going on. Um, there are no factors you, you don't know about. And they can be quite um, general. So it's not, um, you can make general observations that are not then specific to, to one organism. They're quite flexible, they're fast. So you can look at that large parameter range. If you run simulations, you can make many replicates, many more that you could do in a lab. I mean, like you just can run 10 millions of simulations also. Um, I mean, also depends on the simulation. There's also, of course, limits to that. But I mean, it's much easier than um, laboratory experiments to do that. And it's like a time lapse. I mean, it's just much, much faster. And last but not least, no animals get harmed. 
Okay, now let's uh, go back to the biology. And as I said, like um, I want to talk a little bit about like understanding bacterial adaptation um, and yeah, a resistance evolution. And what I want to look at today are plasmids. Um, plasmids, they are pivotal elements of bacterial evolution. Um, so they're extra chromosomal DNA elements. You can see this very simple sketch of a cell here. We have the chromosome and um, the plasmid here. When the cell divides, this plasmid is also transmitted to the to water, daughter cells. But that's not the only thing um, they can do, but um, at least some kinds of plasmid can also horizontally transfer to other cells, to neighboring cells, and not only to cells of the same species, but also um, to cells of different species. And I mean, that's a very like efficient way to spread genes. Okay, so plasmids are a priori a burden to the bacterial cell because it's extra genes that need to be expressed it's also extra DNA that needs to be replicated at cell division. So that's costly for the cell. On the other hand, um, plasmids can carry beneficial genes, for example, virulence genes or also antibiotic resistance genes. And actually, um, bacteria that cause hospital acquired infections often carry resistance not on the chromosome, but on plasmids. An example for this is this um, Klebsiella pneumonia that um, yeah, that's a bacterium that causes, um, for example, I, I mean, it causes um, this um, ventilator associate pneumonia. So, um, yeah, that, that people can um, then, then get in hospitals. And um, yeah, for, for this, for example, uh, resistance can be on plasmids. And this raises a lot of questions. For example, why do beneficial genes not move to the chromosome? Why they, are they on plasmids? How do bacteria and plasmids co-evolve? Do resistant uh, bacteria or plasmids spread? And one question that my postdoc Felix is looking at is what is actually the risk of transfer from commensals to pathogens during treatment? So if we um, carry resistance plasmids in our bacteria, like in our gut that are normally there and they are um, like harmless, but now if an obligate pathogen, in this case, comes like salmonella, what is the likelihood that it actually acquires maybe this resistance plasmids um, from our yeah, commensal bacteria? How do plasmids contribute to bacterial adaptation and resistance evolution? So uh, like, yeah, I've already talked a little about uh, this is I mean, there's this horizontal gene transfer of existence resistance between bacteria, also between bacterial um, species. And that's, of course, like contributing to the spread of resistance genes. But then there's also evolution of new resistance on plasmids possible. So we could have a wild type plasmid that's actually not conferring resistance to the cell, but um, because of a mutation event or also because of transformation event, um, a resistant mutant plasmid um, appears. So mutation would mean then um, here that uh, that the gene on the plasmid uh, gets altered or through transformation also through other plasmids, new genes can be uh, taken up, which would be antibiotic resistance genes. And here now it is um, actually important to know that many plasmids exist in several copies within the bacterial cell. So it's not just one um, copy of this plasmids, but in this case, it would be three. And this, as we will see, influences the evolutionary dynamics of genes of alleles on plasmids. So let me first uh, talk to you about an evolution experiment that has been done in E. coli by Alvaro San Millan and, and others. So here's what they, um, did. They looked at three strains of bacteria. So there was this wild type bacteria that do not uh, carry um, the, the, the resist, a, a resistance ali, a, a resistance gene. They have the strain where a resistance gene is on the chromosome and one where it's on a multi-copy plasmid. And their experiment was 19 copies roughly um, in the cell like copies of this plasmids. And this resistance gene confers resistance to a drug A. But now they exposed it to a different drug, to drug B. 
And um, every day they increase the antibiotic concentration. So every day they double the antibiotic, con um, antibiotic um, concentration. And they looked how many populations of their bacteria, I mean, they looked at several, uh, at many um, populations, and they looked how many of those like um, survive over time. And here's the result. So you can see here in red for this wild type that doesn't have this resistance gene to drug A at all. And you can see that, I mean, it survives um, for yeah, a few days, but then rapidly all those populations go extinct. And it's quite similar when this resistance gene is carried on the plasmid, uh, on the chromosome, sorry, that's in blue. It's different when you look at the one where it's on the plasmid. You also see that a lot of, of, of populations uh, go extinct rather quickly, but then they are here at the end, it's like seven populations that actually survive for a really long time and that can stand very large antibiotic um, concentration. So what has happened in this experiment? So, I mean, resistance to this drug B evolved, and this happened through mutation on one of these plasmids. But now it's initially, it's first on one of these plasmid copies, but the other plasmid copies don't carry this mutation yet. So what happened is actually that at cell division, these plasmid copies were distributed to the daughter cells. And that's not something that uh, happens neatly, where then the, the daughter cells are exact copies of the mother, but there's randomness involved here. And you can see like here, this one daughter cells gets now two of this like red resistance copies and the other one, none at all. In this case, eventually you are getting cells where um, all of these plasmid copies are mutated. Second, what also happened is in the experiment, um, the level of resistance depended on how many copies of this resistance gene are in a cell. And on the chromosome, I mean, you only have this one single copy, but in the plasmid, you have many more. So you're achieving high, more like higher levels of resistance. So even if in the chromosome, the mutation occurs, um, yeah, I mean, the, the cell would not have the same level of resistance. At the same time, actually, it's also less likely to occur because the gene is only there once in the chromosome, but you have 19 plasmid copies, make, it means it's 19 times more likely that mutation actually occurs. Okay, to sum this a little bit up, why this plasmid copy number matters. So what I said last is the mutational input is higher just because you're having more copies of this gene, you have more opportunities for mutation to happen. But then we have this like um, process where these plasmid copies get replicated and they are distributed to the daughter cells at cell division. That's a, um, in this case, like in this way, you can get this um, yeah, cells which have a higher uh, plasmid copy number. On the other hand, it can also always happen that maybe you're losing this resistance uh, plasmid again because maybe the cell on the way to generating this like fully resistant cells. Um, just some cells maybe die, they don't reproduce, and then it would be lost again. So we also then need to consider this process of how this plasmid copies are replicated and segregated. And last, um, what also then matters is, I mean, you're now having many cell types in your population, depending on what fractions of them, um, yeah, of the plasmid copies carry actually our mutation. So what you can see here is um, like a little sketch where the fraction of mutant plasmids is here on the x-axis and the growth rate is on the y-axis. And what I'm showing here, that's um, not what they saw in the experiments, it's a different example, is a dominant mutation where like you can um, achieve a maximum growth rate of what I call here as max. But if you have only one of them mutated, you already achieve it. You don't even need to mutate more to have this high cell fitness. But that could also be different. That would be the other extreme. Maybe all of them need to be mutated to get a really fit cell, or there could be something intermediate. Okay, so our question was now, I mean, motivated by this experiment that I explained to you, how likely is it actually that a population of bacteria that would go extinct due to, for example, antibiotic um, pressure, um, survives this due to um, resistance evolution on such a multi-copy plasmid. So um, you see this here, like kind of the, the scenario we're having in mind is that you are having the number of bacteria here as a function of time. 
first uh, it's stable and you have the cell population where all the plasmids have this wild type plasmid but then um, you start treatment you start giving antibiotics so the population size here is decreasing and the bacterial population would go extinct but it's possible that this resistance mutation appear and then you're getting resi resistant cells and the population recovers and generally one calls such a um, scenario where a population escapes extinction through adaptive evolution um, one calls this evolutionary rescue and now i mean what we wanted to know is when does actually a higher copy number increase the probability of evolutionary rescue and something that um, Mario Santa is working on, or has worked on, um, he's a PhD student um, in my group, and I will, yeah, I mean, walk you through the project. So first here the model. So we need to model this somehow. Um, here's first some notation. So this little n is a plasmid copy number. So if you're looking here at this um, cell, we have three copies of the plasmid. So the plasmid copy number n would be three here. And this little i is, we are counting with this how many of them carry this mutation. That's two. Then cells um, divide in our model at a rate that uh, depends on how many mutant plasmids they carry. And in principle, it can also depend on um, like the total um, plasmid copy number. And then they die at a certain rate that in our model does not depend on the cell type. So we're having this uh, plasmid replication. At this point, all the mutations can happen. And we assume that each of these plasmid copies gets exactly replicated once. And um, then these plasmid copies are segregated um, to the two daughter cells. And we assume that this is just randomly happening. So each of them gets this, again this n copies, but um, whether it's mutant or wild type copies is random. Now, how do we analyze this? And um, so what determines um, the outcome whether our population survives or goes extinct. And I mean, that, that is, it depends basically on two factors. One needs that the rescue type, so in our case, is fully resistant type, or like the rest, it needs to be present somehow, or like at least this, um, yeah, I mean, a type that carries the resistance mutation needs to be present. Um, in our case, it means like it needs to appear sometime during this population decline. However, what's also important is when it appears, it's the first rare. So even if it's a resistant mutation that's helping the cell to survive, there's still a lot of stochasticity um, like, uh, involved. So I put this here in general terms because it doesn't just apply to resistance evolution, but more generally. I mean, even well-adapted individuals may have few or no offspring. So at this initial phase of spread of a beneficial allele, resistance allele or something else, it's a stochastic process with an uncertain outcome. So it just could just come that you have the cell and maybe it divides, you have two cells, but both of them die and then it would be lost again. So when we now want to analyze this, we exactly look at these two factors. So we basically count the number of mutations that are appearing during population decline. And then we are looking at the fates of those lineages. So will they establish and leave a lot of offspring, which means the population will be rescued? Or will there be a stochastic loss just because cells die instead of dividing? So that means Eventually, we're putting the two together and look whether among all those lineages, all those mutations that were generated is the one that is successful. And I mean, to decompose, I mean, we, we could just simulate the entire model instead of making this analysis where we, where we divide it into this, how many mutations appear and looking at the fates of the lineages. But to decompose it in these two factors, in this mutational input and this establishment uh, probability, that is actually useful. I mean, it goes um, beyond just seeing the result at the end because, I mean, it provides additional insights and we can also see whether there are antagonistic effect. I mean, something, you will also see this later, something can maybe help to increase the mutational input, but on the other hand, decrease the establishment probability. And last also, I mean, um, I think that's also something that's, um, you know, if one, if one does such an analysis, it also actually helps um, to think about the problem more clearly and to gain a deeper understanding of the dynamics. So now in this formal analysis, we do exactly what I just said. So because a mutant has to arise somehow, 
So we are counting how, num how many mutations are appearing during population decline. And um, yeah, it's just like there's this U, that's a mutation probability when a plasmid copy gets replicated. Little n is how many plasmid copies um, are there. This lambda zero is a rate at which um, this, this wild type cells that do not carry the mutation replicate and n is a total um, population size. So this is a rate at which mutations appear in our population, but um, as I explained, that's not enough. They also need to escape stochastic loss. So we need to look at the fates of the lineages. So how do they, I mean, do they establish? And um, for this, we use the theory of multi-type branching processes. And just to briefly mention this, I mean, branching processes are a specific type of stochastic process. And um, the, the underlying assumption is that in this case, cells divide independent from each other, so there's no um, competition between the cells. That's a good approximation when you think about this initial spread of a mutation, because at the, at the beginning, when these resistant um, cells are still rare, they won't compete with each other because they are still so rare. And once they are so frequent that they start to compete with each other, then they're safe anyway. There's no stochastic loss happening anymore. And so really like branching process theory is, I mean, it's really mathematically nice and you can uh, derive really nice results. So eventually we need to then also put the two together. So what's basically um, done here in this exponent is this, that we are counting um, all the lineages um, that have been successful. And then this exponential function would tell us the probability that none of them, act uh, that there's actually no successful lineage. Um, that's a zeroth term of a Poisson distribution. I don't know whether there are mathematicians in the audience. Um, so, um, and then the rescue probability is one minus this. So basically, I mean, this, what, all what this formula is doing at the end is looking whether there is a successful lineage among all those lineages that got um, generated in this mutation process here. Okay, I mean, that was just um, to let you know a little bit about um, how we analyze it. Let's look at um, the results. And let's look what actually this dominance function does. So if you think back a few slides, um, that's how, um, yeah, I mean, how the fitness of a cell depends on, um, yeah, on, on how many of these mutants, uh, of these plasmids are mutated. So here in this case, it's a fraction of mutant plasmids in a cell um, and um, how the growth rate depends on that. So this would be a dominant mutation. So one of them mutated is already enough. So we have a perfectly resistant cell. And this is the other extreme where all of them would need to be mutated. And if they're not all mutated, you have like a cell that's perfectly sensitive to the antibiotic. So we then um, yeah, look at two factors. So first is the mutational input. And if you remember back to the previous slide, that was proportional to the plasmid copy number. That's what you can see here. It's linearly increasing with the plasmid copy number. That's, um, that's also intuitive that it's increasing. The more copies you have, the more likely that you get a mutation. Then let's look at the establishment probability. So um, here you see, again, plasmid copy number on the, on the y -ax x-axis and establishment probability on the y-axis. And that's for different strengths of, um, yeah, of fitnesses. So this is this S-max. So this blue would be something where you have a really like strong beneficial effect of the mutation. And um, you can see like the larger the plasmid copy number, the lower the establishment probability. And I mean, that's also one can understand this intuitively. If you think back about um, what I said about the segregation process, I mean, if they have a large plasmid copy number, it actually takes a long time until we reach a cell where all those plasmid copies are mutated. And on the way to there, it's always possible that this resistance mutation gets lost again because cells die instead of dividing. And that's why we have this decrease. We have this in both cases, for the dominant and for the recessive mutation, but you can see that for the recessive mutation, this decay is much stronger. So now finally, let's um, put the two together. Basically what's happening is like, um, I mean, it's this like equation with this exponential function um, from the previous slide. But what does that basically means is multiplying the two lines with each other. So a line that's increasing and one that's decreasing. 
What we see here for the dominant mutation is that this increasing mutational input has a stronger effect. So it means that the rescue probability increases with the plasmid copy number. Right? Also, the establishment prob probability drops. This effect is just stronger. That's different if we look at um, a recessive mutation. Here, this drop in this establishment probability is so strong that it cannot be outweighed by this increase in the mutational input. What this means overall is the more plasmid copies we have, the lower the rescue or resistance probability evolution. Okay, so let's look at an um, application. Because so far we've just said, okay, there is are this dominant uh, function, our mutation is, I mean, it may be dominant, it may be recessive, but we just imposed this. I mean, it's something that we gave as model input. And what I'm showing you next is something where we actually derive this from the little um, yeah, underlying model. So what you can first see in this graph is the growth rate of the bacteria as a function of the external antibiotic concentration. And that's for this wild type um, plasmids. So you see, I mean, low concentration, they have a low growth rate. And um, then they, um, yeah, I mean, as antibiotic concentration decreases, their growth rate drops and becomes also here then negative. And now we assume that their mutated enzymes are like, well, their enzymes in the, in, like, that are encoded on the plasmid, um, but the ones that are mutated, they can degrade the antibiotic within the cell. That means like effectively within the cell, the antibiotic concentration is lower. So it, the cell feels a lower antibiotic concentration. And um, this shifts this curve to the right. So now half of this plus bit would be mutated. And you can um, see now that this, um, yeah, I mean, this cell can stay, uh, stand a much higher anti-concentration than the one where none of this plasmid copies is mutated. And it shifts even further to the right if all of this plasmid copies are mutated. Okay, that's just a very, very simple model, but um, let's do what it, uh, let's see what it does. So what you can see here now is the risk of um, resistance evolution as a function of the antibiotic um, concentration. And that's for different plasmid copy numbers. So there is this blue curve where we would just have a single copy of our plasmid in the cell. And the red one, that's the other extreme that we looked at, that would be 10. And you can see that at this low antibiotic concentrations, the risk of, of resistance evolution is higher if the plasmid copy number is higher. So the red line lies higher than the blue line. But then you can see here that it actually switches. Now, with this low plasmid copy number at the high concentrations, we are having a higher resistance probability than here with this red curve, which is a high pro, um, plasmid copy number. Okay, so this is like, yeah, I mean, when the antibiotic, I mean, it, it may depend on the concentration actually, whether a high or a low plasmid copy number leads to highest probability of um, resistance evolution. Um, we can also understand this um, if you look at the model. And for this, let's look at what is actually the benefit of mutating a certain fraction of plasmids. That's basically the graph that you have seen before with this external antibiotic concentration and the growth rate. And you can see here, if we are at this low antibiotic concentrations and we mutated half of the plasmid, so half of them are now mutated, um, then we have a really huge fitness benefit. And if the other half of them also then uh, is mut uh, mutant plasmids, that actually doesn't change so much anymore. But if we go to a higher antibiotic concentration, we see that here it's different. So now this would be different between a cell where none of them is mutated and 50% are mutated, and it doesn't help that much. However, then if all of them are mutated, that then brings a really big um, fitness benefit. So that basically means if we look at this uh, in this terms of dominance function, it would mean that it is low antibiotic concentrations it's a little bit like a dominant mutation because like just mutating some already helps you a lot. And um, then if the rest is mutated, that doesn't help so much anymore. 
that's different at the high antibiotic concentrations, where then also where actually a high fraction of the plasmids need to carry the resistance mutation to have a high cell fitness. So basically, here it's like a dominant mutation, here it resembles a recessive mutation, intermediate concentrations, it's somewhere in between. Okay, let's go back to our graph and think back what we have seen before. So when we looked at this dominance function, we have seen that if the mutation is dominant, um, then having a high plasmid copy number is actually increases the probability of rescue in this uh, case resistance. And that's exactly what you see here. At this low antibiotic concentration, where now our resistance mutation resembles a dominant mutation, indeed, a high plasmid copy number gives the highest risk of resistance at these low concentrations. It's different at the high concentrations. There, as you've seen on the previous slide, it resembles a recessive mutation. And if you then think back again, for the recessive mutation, we've seen that the probability of rescue, in this case resistance, drops with the plasmid copy number. That means a low plasmid copy number leads to the highest risk of resistance. That's exactly um, what we see here in this plot. So um, we can understand actually why these um, lines cross at some point. Okay, so so far we've only dealt with the question, does our population adapt or not? So will resistance evolve or not? But we haven't looked at what the fixation process of this resistance mutation actually looks like. And that's what Mario did in a second project in collaboration with Anne Kupchok and Tal Dagan. And I mean, we've changed the model here. It just shows this very briefly. I mean, you don't really need this for the following, but I mean, for the ones who are interested in this, um, how we model this. Um, in this case, we looked at a population that has a constant size, as um, a Moran type model. So we still have these birth rates that depend on the number of mutant plasmids. But whenever um, a, um, a cell reproduces, um, we, we choose a cell from the population that dies. Right? So we are just having this replacement process that over time keeps the population size constant. We also now don't look at any stochasticity here. We just look at it deterministically. So I just um, so what we were looking at here is now this x would be the fraction, xi is the fraction of um, cells that carry i mutant plasmids. And we derived um, so differential equations for that. And you don't really, I mean, you don't need to, it just puts the equation here to show you that actually what we get is, I mean, the equation at the end is not that complicated. I mean, it's actually pretty nice. And with this now we looked at what does actually the fixation process look like? How what does it look like when um, this resistance mutation that starts at, in a low frequency of cell eventually fixes in the population that all cells um, carry only this resistance mutation? Okay, so um, what we did here is we start, sorry, that was fast. We start um, uh, at this initial condition, we look, um, um, so, so most of our cells only carry this wild type uh, plasmid, but a low fraction, so one of them, 1% uh, of all cells carries a mutation on one of their plasmids. And this is something, for example, if you did a laboratory experiment and you transformed this mutant allele into the um, into the plasmid, that's um, what you would get as an initial condition. Um, then what we here now looked at is mutant homozygous cells. So those are cells that only on all plasmids carry this mutant allele. We look at heterozygous cells. Those are cells um, where some plasmids carry the resistance allele and the other carry the wild type allele. And we look at the sum of these two. What we then uh, look at is, um, <laughs> um, I, you will see this in the plot and in these graphs in a moment, but I say it in advance. We look at um, when is actually, um, when do all cells um, carry at least one um, plasmid copy? and uh, a mutant plasmid copy, and uh, when do actually all cells carry um, this mutation. And um, what I should say here is, I mean, like I say, all cells, but since it's deterministic dynamics, it would never be strictly 
all, so we're looking actually at 99%. So when do 99% of all cells carry at least one mutated plasmid copy, when do 99% of all cells um, carry only um, yeah, this resistance alleles? And um, yeah, you see this here. Now the frequency of these different um, cell types is a function of time. And um, you can see here in this like uh, yeah, slightly orange line, that is heterozygous cells. And you can see here in this example, they stay at the really low frequency all the time. And those is times this phenotypic um, fixation time and um, the genotypic fixation time are pretty much occurring at the same moment. And what I um, still sh sh should, sh should explain, by the way, I say phenotypic uh, fixation time, we're actually looking here at the dominant allele. That means if you have one of the copies mutated, you already have the resistant phenotype. So that's why I call this a phenotypic um, fixation time. Now, OK, it, it happens at the same time. But now let's look here. This is a case where now selection is much stronger. So here it was 0.1 and um, here it's 0.3. And you can see now it's not occurring at the same time anymore. So there is this window opening up because it's a heterozygosity window. This means um, that now all like 99% or of all cells already carry one uh, on one of their copies, a mutant allele but it still takes um, some time until um, really like 99% of the cells are homozygous for this resistant allele. We also see such a window occurring if instead of increasing selection, we increase the plasmid copy number. And you can see in both of these cases, you can see here also nicely how the heterozygous cells first increase and then later decrease again. We can also increase both. So look at a high plasmid copy number and strong selection. And then you can see how this window is getting larger. This is pretty much also um, shown in this um, graph now here, where we have now the replicon copy number. Replicon, you can, for our purposes, uh, replace by plasmid. So the plasmid copy number on the x-axis and this fixation times on the y-axis. And let's just look at this green line here. That would be the selection coefficient of 0.3, so very strong selection. And you can see first for this um, small plasmid copy numbers, this both fixation times are pretty much identical, but then um, they diverge and we get this, yeah, this heterozygosity window where we have this um, heterozygous cells um, still in our population, although it's phenotypically already fully adapted. So what we observe is that the fixation times increases the plasmid copy number n. So you see these lines are going up. Um, the relative window size increases with n, like with the plasmid copy number and the strength of selection. So it's actually, I mean, it's increasing um, with, with the plasmid copy number. For the, for the strength of selection, at some point, it gets smaller again in absolute terms just because the entire fixation process gets faster, but the relative window size um, still gets um, larger with n. Mario also derived a pretty simple condition when this point actually is where this window opens up in terms of the strength of selection and the plasmid copy number. And I mean, why do we actually care so much about this window? Within this window between this phenotypic and genotypic fixation um, time, this means that there the population is fully adapted because we have this dominant allele. So, that, so each cell is actually already fully resistant, but we also already we still have this genetic variation preserved. So both of the alleles, the wild type allele and the mutant allele, are still present in our population, and that means that maybe the population is could yeah, more easily react to future environmental changes. So for example, if antibiotic pressure is released um, and this antibiotic resistance mutation has a cost, it could be that it's more easily reversible um, than if this resistance mutation has already fixed in the population. So to sum this up, um, so we've seen that the plasmid copy number can have antagonistic effects on the mutational input and then the establishment probability. So you saw that the mutational input is increasing, but the establishment probability is decreasing with the plasmid copy number. And the effect on the rescue probability depends on the um, dominance function. So um, this one here 
was for the dominant mutation where you can see that the probability of rescue was increasing with the plasmid copy number for the recessive, it's decreasing. And in then, um, yeah, on the previous slide, three slides, you have seen that during the fixation process of a dominant allele, genetic variation may be maintained for a long time following phenotypic adaptation. So this is um, like a brief summary of um, the main results, but also um, to discuss this a little bit, also our modeling assumptions. Um, one is what I said at some point is we have this regular, we call this regular replication of plasmid copies. So we assume that each of these plasmid copies gets ex um, replicated exactly once prior to cell division. Um, that's just a convenient assumption. It makes the model a bit easier. But um, yeah, I mean, it's like the, the replication of plasmid copies is more like uh, is, is closer to random replication. They actually um, a random plasmid gets a replica that's, that's um, is chosen for replication. So that would mean that some of these plasmid copies get replicated several times and others none at all. Um, we also looked at that model. Um, I left it out today for, for reasons of um, time. Um, yeah, I mean, most of the um, results still hold. We, we can also um, talk about this more if you're interested. Um, yeah, another like assumption that is really crucial is um, how random is actually the distribution of mutant and wild type plasmids into the two daughter cells. So we assume that each of these daughter cells receives this exact same number of um, plasmid copies, but which type they receive, I mean, how it's distributed to the two daughter cells is random. That's uh, generally um, yeah assumed for plasmid copies uh, for plasmids that have a yeah, highish uh, plasmid copy number. It may not really hold well for low copy number plasmids that have uh, segregated, uh, like active partitioning systems. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, um, so that's also like a, a model um, assumption that is crucial that we make and that may not hold for all plasmid types. Um, yeah, the dominance function, you've seen that that actually plays a pretty crucial role. Um, if, if we look at are these resistance mutations, I mean, are they dominant, are they recessive? They are actually empirical evidence for both for partially dominant and partially recessive mutations. And also for this gene dosage effects, I didn't talk about this um, today, that um, gene dosage effects would be what you've seen in these experiments by Alvaro San Millan. That's actually the more plasmid copies you have, that really depends not on the fraction um, of mutant plasmids on the, op on, on the absolute numbers that would be gene dosage um, effects. And to go a little bit beyond this, multi-copy uh, questions is, um, I mean, or, or not yet, but I mean, give a bit more broader perspective is, um, so what, what we've seen here is that the genetics for many plasmids is shaped by polyploidy. I mean, it's, it's shaped by having multiple copies of the plasmid in the cell. Now going beyond is also, what we haven't looked at um, today at all is uh, that ecological species interactions also modulate the dynamics of um, yeah alleles on plasmids, of course, and also that the dynamics actually span several scales. There are these within cell dynamics, there's between cell dynamics, but eventually also um, between host dynamics. Okay, so I um, mean. With this, I'm at the end of the presentation. And yeah, I mean, I, I would like to thank again the organizers. It was really nice that you invited me. Um, yeah, I would like to thank my team and especially Mario. I mean, he's the one who derived the results that I showed to you today. It was the second project in collaboration with Anna and Tal. And um, yeah, thank you all for your attention. Um, thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Iker. It was very informative and explanatory. And during your presentation, our team compiled the questions from the chat and we would like to forward some of them to you without taking um, so much of your time, if it's is suitable for you to, of yeah. course. Okay, so we can start. So um, I'm going to ask the first question, but first I want to thank you uh, for your presentation too. It was like Inja said, really informative. Uh, the first question is somewhat personal, but uh, I would still like to ask it to you. Since you got uh, your diploma in physics followed up with biomathematics and evolutionary biology, what was the reason you did those shifts? And in which ways <laughs> we... 
<laughs> in which ways being educated and working interdisciplinary affected your perspective and your current research? Yeah, so um, it was, I, I, it's, it's, it's a nice question because it was actually by accident. So, I mean, I've always been, um, so when I studied uh, physics, I already did uh, a lot of math and I mean, I was a bit between the two and I already did theoretical physics. So I think that the shift to math was not for me really such a shift. I mean, it was always for me somehow clear that I want the theoretical side and not um, that I wouldn't go um, into experimental physics. Um, but then that I went into biology was really by accident. I was I wanted to do mathematics, but also something applied. And so I stumbled across this biomathematics group in Vienna where I did my PhD. And um, then I, I just found this interesting and I liked it. And that's how I, I then sort of slided into biology. Um, yeah, I think it's, if one makes this transition, I think it's a little bit, um, Oh, from the modeling side, I mean, it's it's similar, right? I mean, it's kind of, I, I knew the tools and the methods. I mean, of course, also learning new ones, but in principle, I had the background for this. But um, of course, I had to learn really a lot of biology. Um, yeah, they had, I had little knowledge and I was, you know, at the beginning, the transition is not so difficult because you're given the project by your supervisor and so on. But then, um, yeah, one needs to learn the biology to be able to, to develop own um, projects. And even though I think I've read up a hell lot of biology, I still feel, I mean, biologists just don't know so much more than I do. <laughs> I, I answer, did, did this answer your question? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will ask the next question. Um, first of all, thank you for the nice present presentation. Um, I want to ask you uh, about uh, slide that you showed in your presentation there was an experiment of alvaro san milan with e coli bacteria um, in that slide there was a graph showing the number of um, surviving population uh, in relation to antibiotic uh, concentration um, i've noticed that the bacteria which had re the resistance genes um, in their plasmids were stronger in um, high concentrations of antibiotics but um, they are dying earlier in low concentrations um, what is the reason for that um yeah it's a good question i don't actually know i mean um it, it could I, I don't know whether there were any costs maybe associated with the plasmid or so but i um yeah i, I really don't know i mean it's not experiment that i did so <laughs> yeah okay, thank you uh, i'm sorry <laughs> thank you again your presentation i have another question um with the increasing rates of antibiotic resistance, do you think that there will be a time where we need a completely new strategy used for microbes? Or with rescue plants applied efficiently, can we overcome this problem? Oh, yeah. Um, it's a very hard question, <laughs> I think. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I personally think that probably we'll, we, we, we go both routes. I, I kind of hope that, uh, first of all, that antibiotic resistance, uh, I mean, like, it's it's not only, I mean, of course, how, how we use antibiotics, but also how many we use. So, I mean, like, it just should be used way less, especially, for example, also in agriculture. Um, also just using it when it's really necessary and not, I mean, yeah not to treat viral in infection that you cannot treat with antibiotics anyways. Right? I mean, so um, a reduction of antibiotic use um, also, yeah, I mean, like using better strategies. Um, but I also think, I mean, of course, also development of new antibiotics, also that has, I mean, that has slowed down a lot. Like, I mean, like um, the rate at which um, new antibiotics are developed. Um, yeah, I mean, it's much slower now than, than it was in the past. But I mean, it will also happen, I think. And I think that um, we, we are also looking at alternatives, I guess. I mean, for example, I mean, one option is phage therapy. So um, like phages are viruses that infect bacteria and that could be used also to treat bacterial infections. Um, and that's something that has been, the, the idea go, goes back a long time, I think a hundred years or something, um, but has been abandoned when that antibiotics um, got, yeah, let's say, it invented um, because doctors felt more comfortable uh, you know like giving chemicals to patients than phages um, 
but actually it's something that could maybe also i mean there's one institute institute in in, in georgia um that actually has kept doing research on phage therapy so that that could also be still an alternative option so i i, I mean yeah i really don't know whether we are able to really just overcomes this resistance problem or whether we need alternative strategies probably i think like we also will need i i personally think probably we will also need alternative strategies but i don't know <laughs> thank you i think i'll ask the last question and this is also a question from the comments uh, how can we know that peer rescue is convergent for all possible mutation frequencies um, I'm not sure I understand. Can, can you repeat the question? Um, um, once more? Okay, I think this is about the mathematics part of your experiments. Mm -hmm. Like, how can we know that peer rescue is convergent for all possible mutation frequencies? I mean, it must be convergence because it's a probability. <laughs> so it can never get larger than one. Um, I mean, it, it, it can it can go to one, right? I mean, if the mutation probability gets really high, then you would have a rescue probability of one. But I'm not not totally sure whether this was a question. Um, if the person who, who asked a question can also send me an email and specify your word or ask again or, yeah. Okay, thank you very much again. Mm, okay, I think uh, those are all, all the questions that we can fit in our time limit. So thank you so much again, uh, Dr. Urker, for your presentation and your talk, and also for the collaboration with us. Uh, it was really pleasant to see you here, and I hope we can see you in our next talks too. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, th thank you. That was, I mean, I really enjoyed it. It was very nice, and thanks again for inviting me. Okay. Then bye. Bye.